Good to have our uh, missionary from Chile with us, Brother Steve Wells. Is it w with an S or just no S? Just Steve Well. You're well. Okay. And uh, he's here uh, without his wife. His wife has uh, got a sore back, I guess. And I'm here without my wife. So I told him right after service, it's guys' night. You know? <laughs> Amen. I I just love having missionaries come. I don't know if all of you feel the same way. I think you do. I just love having missionaries come to share their burden and uh, just hear about you know what it is that's going on in other parts of the world. I mentioned to him when we were talking beforehand that now that he's visited Vancouver Island, that maybe I'll I'll visit him when he gets down to his mission field in Chile. Hey, man, I'd love that. I just. And I uh, just think that would be just great. So I'm so glad to have you here, Brother Well. And if you want to come up, and we're just going to uh, let you just do whatever you feel, present your burden, preach to us, and uh, just so happy you're with us today. God bless you. God bless you, sir. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. It is so good to be able to come in and to feel the presence of the Lord. And, uh, you know, I don't know how your day was. Uh, probably busy, and uh, most days uh, are busy. Scriptures tell us that uh, every day is uh, kind of a opportunity, but every day brings its own worries, its own uh, problems, its own challenges, but it is good to be able to come and feel the presence of the Lord and to focus upon uh, what life is really about. You know, many, many years ago, there was a man by the name of Gladstone, and uh, he uh, was very faithful. He loved God. He came to church and uh, never missed unless he was just absolutely too sick to be in church. And uh, as time went by, he began to uh, experience some health problems. And uh, one of the problems he had is he began to lose his hearing. And uh, as uh, it happens many times, uh, he began to battle with it, and finally it reached the place where uh, Gladstone totally lost his hearing. A lot of people in the church had been praying for him, and it was sad that uh, he had lost his hearing, and most folks thought, well, you know, uh, he won't be coming to church uh, as he did before because uh, back then, there was no one to interpret in sign language, and there certainly was no projection up on the wall so he could sing along. So he just was there and couldn't tell what was going on. But nevertheless, he was faithful, kept coming to church. And uh, now uh, he couldn't really communicate, but he carried around a little notebook and a little pencil with him. And he would just write notes and communicate with people that way. And uh, one time... Uh, after uh, it, this had gone on for uh, a few months, one of the saints in the church uh, asked him for his notebook, and they wrote a question on it and showed it to him. And the question was, Brother Gladstone, uh, why do you keep coming to church since you can't hear what's going on and uh, can't get anything out of it? Because it was very evident uh, he couldn't sing what was going on, and he wasn't quite on cue with his amens and praise the Lord when the pastor was preaching. So why do you come? He got his pencil and pad, wrote his answer, and showed it to them. He said, I still feel the need to be in an atmosphere of worship. You know, something transpires when we're in an atmosphere of worship and begin to glorify the Lord. You could have had you could have had a good day. You could have had a bad day. But when we come into His presence, Amen. Enter into His presence and begin to focus upon Him and glorify Him and adore Him. You know, things begin to fall in their perspective places. Uh, things be, be, our priorities get rearranged the correct way as we get our eyes up on the Lord. And I am so blessed and thankful to be able to be here. Uh, in British Columbia, again, after many, many years, I told your pastor, I think the last time I was in British Columbia was 1992. So it's been a while, and I didn't have the privilege of coming on the island, so I am blessed tonight. Thank you for allowing me to be with you, and I give honor to Pastor Nickel, and uh, his wife is not here, but also to her and to the leadership here in the church and to you, the faith, 
faithful saints uh, of God here. Amen. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for allowing me to come and share uh, with you. And uh, I uh, bring greetings from my wife. Uh, she has a pinched sciatic nerve and is battling with that. So, you know, traveling and being seated in a car for hours on t- on end and pinched sciatic nerves just don't uh, don't agree very good. So pray for her. She is feeling better. So I trust that shortly she will be uh, able to travel with me because after being married almost 34 years, I just really, uh, I'm kind of used to her being around and uh, don't like her when she's not around. Amen. But I'm an MK. I'm a missionary's kid. I'm a product of global missions, foreign missions. And uh, my wife is Chilean. So she also is a product uh, of missions. And uh, I met her at uh, our national conference in Chile in 1980. Five and uh, we were married in in uh, 1986. The Lord has blessed us. We have two daughters that are serving the Lord. We are so thankful for that. Our oldest is uh, going to be 30 next week. And she and her husband live in Southern California and uh, are very active in their church there. Our youngest daughter is in Michigan, finishing up college, and uh, she's the music director at her church. And so I feel very blessed and honored uh, to serve the Lord. And I'm so thankful uh, that my daughters are also serving the Lord. And my wife and I uh, were missionaries uh, in Chile for 14 years. And God blessed us. We were able to pastor the headquarters church in the capital city of Santiago, as well as the church in Rancagua, about 100 kilometers south of the capital city. And uh, we were happy there, uh, working, serving the Lord, but uh, the Lord called us back to North America. So we have been in the U.S. pastoring for the last 20 years. We went and started a church in Miami, a multicultural church there, had 16 nationalities of Spanish-speaking people. And uh, then for the last 10 years or so, we've been pastoring in Michigan, uh, just, we pastored in Flint, Michigan. I don't know if you heard of the Flint water crisis kind of put us on the map in a bad way. Uh, not, not a good situation. Flint's about uh, 80 miles, uh, due West of, of Sarnia, Ontario. So, uh, we, we've been there laboring for the Lord, but, uh, the Lord has called us back to Chile and we are happy about it. Thankful for it. And, uh, we have uh, never broken ties with Chile. I've gone back once or twice a year. Uh, for the last 20 years, back and forth, and visiting and uh, ministering, preaching there. And uh, Chile is a very unique country. And I was telling uh, your pastor that uh, being here in uh, British Columbia kind of makes me homesick because it's very similar to where we live. Uh, Chile is the longest, narrowest country in the world. And uh, if you could see it on the map, on the world map, uh, you can see that it is on the southwestern side of South America. And uh, we uh, travel extensively in Chile. And uh, to give you a little idea of the size of the country, uh, if you could, con- could combine the countries of Italy, Portugal, and Japan, it would just be slightly larger landmass-wise uh, than Chile. Now, if you could flatten Chile out, it'd really be a big country because it's very mountainous. Uh, our mountains go up almost to 23,000 feet tall. So they're very tall, uh, snow covered all year long. We have the Pacific Ocean all the way down. Our, our climate in the north uh, is dry, but where we live, it's very similar to this here. And as you go farther south, it gets cold. Uh, and uh, it is a uh, very, very Beautiful country, and uh, we can't wait till your pastor comes down and visits us. Amen. I think that sounds like the will of God. Amen. Hallelujah. But uh, you can see that uh, if you could bring Chile up to North America, uh, it is uh, almost 2,700 miles long. So if you could stretch it from east to west across uh, the U.S., you could put one end at uh, San Francisco. The other end would reach out past New York City. Uh, into uh, the ocean a little ways there. Or if you would turn it north to south and put one end at Toronto, the other end would be down in Columbia. That's how long it is. So you see, we travel extensively uh, up and down uh, Chile. Our furthest northern church from where we are in the capital city 
uh, is about a 24-hour drive. Now, that's not rest stop, and that's not uh, refueling, and that's not uh, hamburger stops. That's just driving. And uh, get up there on the Peruvian border up in the desert, and uh, we have a church in the city of Arica. Now, to get to our southernmost church, if you turn around and go south, it's just a few hundred miles further uh, as the crow flies, but it would take you 50 hours nonstop. There is a bus that you can get on. Uh, there are bus lines. Uh, we have good over-the-road bus service, but it takes 50 hours to get to Punta Arenas, Chile. Somebody said, well, if it's, only, if it's only a few hundred miles longer, why does it take so long? Geography. Because you have to get on the ferry, ferry across the ocean, and then drive a little ways and get on another ferry, and then drive and get, go over into Argentina and back and forth and back and forth uh, because of the mountains and the fjords and the ocean. Uh, it's uh, impossible to build uh, highways in many of the areas, but uh, 50 hours later, you arrive in the city uh, of Punta Arenas, Chile. And uh, I am glad to be able to tell you that Punta Arenas is home to the southernmost United Pentecostal Church in the world. Down on the Straits of Magellan, way down, uh, it is uh, home to the southernmost UPC uh, in the world. Now, as I mentioned, we live in Santiago, the capital city. Uh, the population of Chile is uh, just a little over 18 million people. 91% of them are urban dwellers. Uh, and the greater Santiago area has a little in excess uh, of 7 million people. Uh, I think the greater Toronto area uh, has about 6.5 million people, so just a little bit larger than the, than the metro Toronto area. You can see the, the uh, mountains there, snow-covered all year long, and uh, it is Chile is a very modern, very progressive country. It is the most progressive modern country uh, in South America. And uh, due to that fact, during the last couple decades, we have experienced a lot uh, of change in the country. Uh, one of the greatest changes we've had is we have had a massive influx of immigrants moving into Chile. People from other South American countries, Argentina, Peru, uh, Colombia, Venezuela, due to the current situation there, the difficulties that the people in Venezuela are living, they're going to other countries. And uh, we've had a, a, a massive influx of uh, immigrants. Chile has had to undergo Im uh, immigration reform. And when they come in from other countries in South America, uh, we speak Castilian Spanish. And so they have to adapt to our uh, brand of Spanish. Some people come in from Brazil. Uh, they speak Portuguese, but that's fairly close to what we speak, uh, fairly close to Spanish. Um, and so they adapt. But we have had a, another group of people that have migrated in by the thousands in the last eight or ten years, and uh, they don't speak Spanish. They speak Creole French because they're from the island of Haiti. We've had many thousands of people coming in from Haiti into Chile. It's a long ways from Haiti, uh, but they have come there to try to better themselves. And uh, unfortunately, when uh, many of them arrive, uh, things are not the way they th have been uh, portrayed to them. They have to pay someone uh, to help them get everything in order. Someone on the Haitian side uh, gets everything in order. They have to have a certain amount of money, and they have to have a work contract to be able to migrate to Chile. So they get the work contract, the promise of a job, and when they get there, someone's waiting for them, and uh, they usually pick them up. But what they do is they take them to an apartment, usually on the outskirts of the capital city somewhere, and uh, put them in there with a lot of other Haitian uh Immigrants, sometimes uh, 10, 15, 20 in a one- or two-bedroom apartment, and then they disappear. And they find out that their work contract is false. It's not worth the paper it's written on. There they are in a, in a foreign country, can't speak the language, don't know the customs and culture, can't get around, and on top of it, they're used to tropical weather. Our weather's cool, cold in the wintertime. And so they really, really are at a tremendous disadvantage, and it is uh, very difficult for them. Now, I mentioned uh, that uh, northern Chile is uh, desert, and uh, if you would go with us to the Atacama Desert, you would be in the driest desert in the world. 
It is so dry that in certain areas there, scientists have been unable to find bacteria. That's dry. Really dry. Before the Apollo missions, NASA sent astronauts and uh, scientists down there because they say it's the closest thing to the lunar terrain in certain areas there that we have on the planet. And now that's not our She's for Christ vehicle, but I want to thank you for giving to She's for Christ. Amen. It helps us and buys us a vehicle. And as you can see, we have a long, long country to travel in. When we go back, we will not be pastoring as we did previously, but we will be traveling extensively the whole length of the country back and forth, teaching seminars, helping establish Bible schools, preaching in the churches, and uh, I believe in training uh, the next generation so that they can continue to be steadfast in the doctrine. So we ask that you pray uh, for us uh, and uh, help us. Now, there are a couple questions that we're always asked about Chile, and uh, I want to address those tonight so you won't be wondering uh, the whole service. Uh, they ask us, a lot of people ask us, do you eat chili in Chile? Uh, no, we don't eat chili in Chile. They don't even know what it is. And then people ask us, is it chili in Chile? Well, the next slide will answer that question for you. Yes, it is chili in Chile. Uh, being the closest country to the Antarctic, we have penguins. Uh, so uh, it, in, in southern Chile, it is quite chilly. Uh, and... Uh, the Lord has, has blessed, and uh, we are so thankful for the national pastors, uh, national saints in Chile. God has blessed. There are approximately 70 churches, so between 70 and 75 churches uh, through Chile, and I am so thankful to tell you that revival fires are burning. Amen. The next few slides will let you see part of our conferences and some of the churches that God, what God is doing, and uh, we are so excited about the revival and the victory that God has given us, and we are believing Him for greater things yet to come. Amen. Hallelujah. We serve a God uh, of the impossible. Remember the Haitians? Remember the people I was talking about from Haiti? I'm thankful to be able to tell you that there are two churches in the capital city of Santiago that every week, this is United Pentecostal Church of Chile, where we speak Castilian Spanish, but in two of our churches in the capital city, every week they preach the Acts 2.38 Jesus name message in Creole French, reaching out to the Haitians. God's giving us revival among the nationals from Chile and among, from, uh, among the immigrants that are coming in. There's revival and victory, saints, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise God. And, and uh, we are so excited about that. Uh, but yet there is so much left to do. We have so much more uh, to accomplish. And it is a daunting task. And without the Lord, we will not be able to, to do it. But I uh, believe that God uh, has uh, promised us and uh, not only has he promised us, but he has been faithful in the past, and I know he will be faithful in the future. And um, has anyone heard of Easter Island? Easter Island belongs to Chile. It is uh, typically, uh, well, I guess you could call it uh, our Hawaii, uh, because it is about 2,300 miles out into the Pacific Ocean, and they are totally different from the Hispanic uh, mainlanders. They are of Polynesian descent. And I would like to leave a prayer meeting with you, a prayer request with you tonight. Help us pray for Easter Island and for the Rapa Nui people, because to our knowledge, the Jesus name message has never been preached on Easter Island. And the problem is, although I feel a burden for it as a foreigner, I can't say, okay, I'm called of God, I'm a missionary sent by the United Pentecostal Church of North America, I want to come and start a church here because they, the Chilean government and the, the Rapa Nui people themselves are very protective of their culture and their heritage. So I can't go start a church. Even our mainlander uh, Chileans can't go out there and start a service. But we serve a strategic God. He doesn't have problems and hang-ups and impossibilities like we do. Our prayer is, Lord, help us. And I believe God can lead us to a Rapa Nui that's living in the capital city or somewhere on the mainland. Our paths can cross divinely and uh, help us pray that we can find that key person. If God will lead us and we can find that key person, we can teach them a home Bible study, witness to them, 
baptize them in Jesus' name after they repent of their sins and pray them through the Holy Ghost and say, all right, this is what you have received. Go back to your people and take it and begin to witness to your people. I believe it's possible for us to have revival on Easter Island. Amen. Hallelujah. So please help us pray that God would would help us to reach Easter Island because they need, they deserve an opportunity to hear this glorious, life-changing message. And uh, we want to join hands as we return with the Chilean pastors and ministers. We will be working in ministerial development uh, and support in Bible schools, seminars, and many other things. And I would like to invite you tonight, uh, give you an opportunity to join the CRT, the Chilean Revival Team. Amen. I would like to uh, invite you to uh, join with us, and uh, we need, number one, your prayers. Please pray for us. We, we need prayer that God would lead us, that we would be sensitive to his leading, and uh, also we need financial backing from the North American Church Partners in Missions. And so I uh, would like to invite you to uh, seriously consider becoming involved in prayer and a monthly PIM with the work of God and us as we return uh, back to Chile. And, uh, you know, God has strategically placed each and every one of us in his kingdom. He has a divine purpose for you. You have talents, you have callings, you have abilities that are uniquely yours. You're important in the church, in your local assembly, and in the kingdom of God in general. And uh, thank God for the different talents and different abilities. When I pastored, I had some, some, some folks in the church with, ex, with just extraordinary talent. And if I needed something done in a, in a specific area, uh, if I needed some, somebody to, to cook a good meal, I knew I could call Sister Star. Brother and Sister Star were retired pastors, but they didn't retire from working for God. They, they uh, came and were members of our church. We pastored mission. We're faithful. But if I called Sister Star and said, Sister Star, we need to have a, a meal after service, she'd get it organized. Now, if I needed the building worked on, if we had to fix the roof or something, our building was uh, that we had was built in 1898, so we had a lot of maintenance to do. 121 years old. I knew I could call Brother George. Say, Brother George, this is wrong with the building. He'd get out there and fix it. Because God's given different talent and different abilities, and it's very much the same in your congregation. But not any of us are able to do it all ourselves. Let's consider a pencil. Everybody's got pencils laying around. If you lose one, you really don't get too distraught about it because they're cheap, and we usually buy them by the packs. Just go get another one. And if you're like me and wear the top end out quicker than you do the bottom, you just discard it and get another one. But you know, there's no single person that is able to build or make a pencil by themselves. Have you ever stopped to think of how the pencil was made? Here in the Pacific Northwest, beautiful trees. Timber industry is a big thing. Maybe the wood came from the Pacific Northwest, the logging industry, huge industry. A lot of people work in that. The graphite could have come from a mine somewhere in northern South America. Again, a whole group of people that we never see, never think about, produced, mined the, the graphite, and produced it. The eraser could have come from Maybe a rubber plantation in Malaysia somewhere. Who knows where the little metal band came from? Stop and think about it. Hundreds, if not thousands of people had to work, make their product, process it, ship it to the pencil factory. The pencil factory, again, a lot of other people working, make the pencil, paint it yellow, stamp number two on it, and sell it to us. And we use it and never, don't think about hundreds or thousands of people doing their job, never seeing each other, to make a pencil. 
You know, the kingdom of God is a lot like that, only we're not making pencils. We're preaching the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ, the Acts 2.38 message of salvation and none other to the world. Amen. And you might not ever get a chance to go to Chile. You might not ever see the people in Chile, but you can have a vital part of, wor of the work of God in Chile and other countries. So thank you so much for supporting global missions. Thank you for your burden, your vision, your passion, your sacrifice, and helping it be possible for us to go to the country of Chile and preach the Word of God. Hallelujah. You know, God calls us. We respond. But you, the North American church, send us. And we are so very grateful for that. Amen. And uh, I could talk to you all night long, uh, or at least quite a while, uh, about Chile. But I don't want to uh, talk too much uh, here tonight about Chile and uh, bore you. I get very passionate about it. Uh, but I'd like to talk a little bit about the Word of God. Amen. So if you would go with me to the book of Mark chapter 11. I want to uh, read here a few verses starting in Mark eleven twelve. The book of Mark chapter 11. Now, since I'm an MK and most of my ministry uh, has been uh, in Spanish in South America, and then when I came back to Miami, just the last uh, 10 years has been in, in English. Uh, I have been noted, noted to, if I get a little excited and get to talking a little faster than I'm thinking or something, I've been noted to uh, say a word or two in Spanish. So if I do that tonight, I get off track. You just bear with me say, God bless him. He just didn't know any better. Amen. But uh, if you'll allow me to, I would like to start off here like we would uh, if we were in Chile. Is that all right? All right. Well, thank you for your confidence. When you find Mark 11, Verse 12, say amen. amen. All right, that's the way we do it in Chile. It makes me feel at home. It says, and on the morrow when they were come from Bethany, he, speaking of Jesus, was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. The time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered, and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. Verse 20. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, behold the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. And Jesus answering, saith unto them, have faith in God. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, that what, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to talk to you for the next few minutes with the help of the Lord on the thought, the blessing in the cursing of the fig tree. Mark tells us here that the morning after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he and his disciples were walking down the road, leaving Bethany. I don't know many of the details, but apparently they had not had breakfast because it says Jesus was hungry. Now, if Jesus was hungry, I know for sure that those rough, tough fishermen, Peter, James, and John, were famished. And the rest of the folks were probably hungry also, the other disciples. Now, I don't know uh, about you, but when I was growing up, I heard my mom tell me many, many, many times, son, don't ever skip breakfast. It's the most important meal you'll eat all day long. Did anybody else get preached that when you were young? My mom told me time and time and time again, don't skip breakfast. It's important, more important than any meal took me a while to figure it out, but I finally figured out why she told me that. 
because my grandma told her. You know, we have a lot of things we pass down from generation to generation. We don't even know why or how it works. But breakfast was a big deal at, at Grandma and Grandpa's house, and I always loved to go uh, to Grandma and Grandpa's for breakfast because uh, Grandpa used to work when he when uh, my mom and her brothers were small. They uh, Grandpa worked uh, midnights, third shift, and he would rest during the day, wake up about dinner time, and Grandma wouldn't wouldn't cook dinner for uh, him. He she would uh, cook breakfast, and uh, the family commonly ate breakfast for dinner. I love to go to grandma's house, number one, because grandma and grandpa spoiled me. I was the oldest grandson and the son of their only daughter. So uh, I enjoyed grandma and grandpa's house. But breakfast was a big deal because grandma would make biscuits and sausage gravy and eggs and bacon and uh, hash browns and uh, cinnamon rolls a lot of times and coffee, and milk, and juice. It was just a great time to have breakfast at grandma's house. You know how we are sometimes now. Um, we live in a world that uh, seems like we never get caught up. We're always in a hurry, always rushing, always running. We have more technology than ever before, but somehow this technology that's supposed to have made our lives easier uh, just is not doing its job. Sometimes we wake up, and if you're like me, you might sleep a few minutes too late or just have get up on time or even sometimes earlier than uh, usually, but you have so many things to do that you don't get them done, and you just grab a cup of coffee and head out the door in a rush. We just live in a rush, and uh, we, don't, we don't get a chance to have breakfast. I don't know what the situation was here with Jesus and the disciples, but they started out from Bethany, starting towards Jerusalem, without having had breakfast. And Mark tells us that Jesus saw a fig tree off in the distance and began to walk towards the fig tree. Now, that was not a revelation for the Lord that that fig tree was there. He knew it was going to be there before it ever was grown before it ever started, before it even sprouted up out of the ground, because he's the creator and sustainer of all things. But he saw the fig tree, and he started walking towards the fig tree as it was in the distance. It became evident to the disciples, Jesus is headed towards the fig tree. Mark says, when Jesus arrived at the fig tree, he found that there was no fruit on it. And so he did something that, would, that seemed totally out of character. Jesus cursed the fig tree. Now, I'm sure the disciples wondered what's going on because Jesus was kind. He was merciful. He was loving. He was patient. He walks up to a fig tree, and because it doesn't have any fruit on it, he curses it. And then continues on his way to Jerusalem and the disciples following. They probably were wondering, what's this all about? Why did Jesus do that? When my girls were, were young, and uh, even uh, up in their teenage years, sometimes they say, Dad, uh, we're hangry. That's when you get so hungry you get angry? Maybe the disciples thought Jesus was hangry. Something happened. We don't know what happened, but Jesus cursed the fig tree. He continued on his way with his disciples, went into Jerusalem, cleansed the temple. I'm sure Jesus and the disciples did some other things as they were in Jerusalem. And the next morning they passed right back past the fig tree. And they found that it had dried up from the roots. Now, I have heard many explanations offered as to why Jesus cursed the fig tree, and you probably have too. One of the reasons that I've heard and the things that some have offered as a suggestion is that it's because fig trees have two crops of figs a year. I know that's true because when I was... Uh, 
going to school, living in Chile. My parents were missionaries. When I lived at home uh, in my youth. We rented a house. My mom and dad rented a house, and there was a huge fig tree in the backyard. had big leaves, bigger than my hands. And there is a spring crop of figs. They're real big, but they're not real plentiful. We call them brevas. In Hebrew, they're called tashk. In English, I think we just call them early figs. You have to look around behind the leaves, but you can find them there. Now, in the fall, they're smaller, but they're a lot more plentiful and a whole lot sweeter. I love to eat fresh figs. And so some have said it wasn't time for, when the Bible says it wasn't time for figs, that meant it wasn't time for the fall figs, but Jesus knew it was spring and it was, there should have been some tashk on there, early figs on it, and there wasn't, that's why he cursed the fig tree. Okay, if that's what you believe, that sounds logical. Others have offered another train of thought. They said it's because the fig tree showed all the signs of having figs, but did not. Others have given it more a spiritual focus, saying it is to let us know and to be aware of the dangers of living a fruitless life. Yet others have given, a, given it a prophetic interpretation, saying it was symbolic of the coming destruction of Israel. Maybe there's some truth in all of those. I don't know what the answer was. Scripture doesn't say what the answer was. Perhaps there could be some truth in any of them. But as they pass back the very next day by the fig tree, Peter saw it along with the other disciples, and Peter cried out, astonished, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. You can cut a tree down, or it can be uprooted and blow over in a storm, but it takes a little while for the leaves to wither up and fall off. And in Michigan, where we pastored, it uh, was pretty cold in the wintertime. Last year, I think we got between eight and nine feet of snow. So we supplemented our gas bill with wood. We had a airtight wood-burning stove, plus we had a fireplace. We would go out, my dad and I, we'd go out and get all the free wood we could. I think we, my last winter there, we burned uh, at our house between five and six cords of wood. But you can take, cut a tree down, cut it in 14, 16 inch pieces. My dad had a big hydraulic 20 ton, 27 ton splitter. You can split the wood up, but you can't burn it immediately. It has to cure, it has to dry. We hopefully, hopefully could get something early enough in the spring. We got on as soon as weather would be permitting. We like to get dead standing trees. But if we got a live tree and had to cut it down, we would try to do it in the spring and split it up and stack it, and hopefully it would cure enough to the end of, or midwinter towards the end of winter. We could mix it in with some other dried uh, uh, wood and burn it. It takes a while for trees to dry up. But the, uh, the disciples were astonished because... The day before, Jesus had cursed the fig tree, and it was totally dried up from the roots. And they began to, again, go over in their mind. Number one, why did he curse the fig tree? And then after he cursed the fig tree, how was it that it was totally dried up and withered away the very next day? Questions begin to race through their mind. Peter, I don't think, was calling Jesus' attention to the fig tree when he said, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursest is withered away. I believe Peter had a question, and he was astonished and wanting an answer. He was wanting Jesus to tell him, all right, come in, come in, fellas. I, I want to give you a lesson here. I didn't tell you yesterday, but I'm going to tell you today. And so they, they Peter, as he did many times, was the first to speak. And the other disciples were intent also on finding out. And Jesus did answer them. He answered them with some strange words. Verse 22, Jesus answered 
answering saith unto them, not just to Peter, to all of them, have faith in God. Well, yes, Lord, we're trying our best to have faith in you. That's why we left our nets and our boats and Matthew left his tax table. Everyone left their livelihood. We're following you. But now, Lord, we're faced with this fig tree. We want to understand. And if you would help us understand, if you would give us an explanation, our faith would grow exponentially. We'd have all that much more faith in you. Just give us an answer for this, Lord, and we'll have great faith in you. You see, Jesus was not intent on simply answering their question. His purpose was to give them much more than an answer for that fig tree. He wanted to give them instructions on how to live a victorious life. Verse 23, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Peter, the rest of you, you're looking for an answer. But I want to tell you, have faith in God. And he went on to say it is a prerequisite, it, it, it is the absence of doubt is a requirement, and he shall not doubt in his heart, then you will be able to have whatsoever you ask. Peter, don't try to figure out why and how. Just put forth an effort, your best effort to have in God even when you don't have an answer. Peter, you have this fig tree today that you're questioning, but there are going to be a whole lot of questions down the road. And I don't want to just teach you why I cursed the fig tree, but I want to instill in you a principle because there is a blessing in the cursing of this fig tree that I want you and the others to learn. Because you're going to face a whole lot more fig trees in life. There are going to be a whole lot of uncertainties. And I don't know how it is in British Columbia, but we have fig trees in Chile. I'm talking about spiritual fig trees. I'm talking about some situations and issues that we face and can't figure out. And personally in my life, I've had fig trees and walked up to them and stood there and couldn't figure them out. And I asked the Lord, Lord, what about my fig tree? Lord, I want an answer. You know, that it would be easy if that was the situation. But sometimes I feel like I'm in a grove of fig trees. Questions here, and I can't figure that out, and something else pops up. I turn to the right, and there's fig trees here, fig trees there, fig trees, fig trees everywhere. And we wrestle with it and try to figure it out, and Lord, we cry out, Lord, I, I need an answer. I'm facing this uncertainty. I'm facing this problem in my life, and I, I don't know how to deal with this. But the very same answer that Jesus spoke unto the disciples, he's speaking unto us today as we face uncertainties, as we face challenges, as we face trials in our life. The word of God is still the same. Have faith in God. I don't know how it works, but I can tell you it works when we have faith in God. If we can get to the place where we say, Lord, I don't understand this fig tree. I don't like this fig tree. I wish it didn't exist in my life. But in spite of how I feel and in spite of everything else, I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to believe your word. I'm going to wait upon you because you alone are the answer. The absence of doubt, Peter is a requirement if you're going to be victorious. I love to read the book of Hebrews chapter 11. The faith chapter. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Dropping down to the sixth verse, it says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 
The writer of Hebrews said faith is vital in the life of a child of God. Back up to verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Amen? Faith is substance. It is the evidence of things not seen. So faith is substance. Faith is evidence. Now bear with me just a little bit because by nature I, I sometimes am, am a little bit analytical. Faith is substance. Faith is evidence. Amen? So we put the two together. Faith is substantial evidence. Any time that there is a court proceeding, if the attorney that is defending the case can present substantial evidence, he or she knows they can win. Because if they go in and present substantial evidence, the jury or the judge will receive the substantial evidence. It's something that is absolutely 100% rock solid proof. Substantial evidence. They know you, that they just have to go through the procedures, go through the motions, get the paper signed, and they will win the case. Hebrews chapter 11 says, there is a guarantee for the child of God to be victorious in our walk with God. Because as we believe God, as we trust God, as we stand in front of the fig trees of our life, and we hear the voice of the Lord, when we don't have to worry about every situation and every detail, but we say, Lord, I don't understand it, but in spite of the fig tree that I'm standing in front of, it died yesterday. It withered up today. I don't understand it, but I'm going to have faith in you. I'm going to have substantial evidence that you're going to give me the victory, and I am going to come through this stronger in my relationship with you. Amen. Hallelujah. There's victory for those who are willing to put their faith and confidence in Jesus Christ. Obviously, when we go back to the nation of Chile, we're going to face some, some substantial trials and situations, but also we can have substantial evidence that our God is going to give us the victory. Amen. In Port Alberni, you face some fig trees, but there is substantial evidence that we can get a hold of tonight that God is going to see us through, that our prayers are going to be answered, that we will be victorious, that our loved ones, we will reach them, that God is going to open the windows of heaven and give us exactly what we need. I believe it tonight. Hallelujah. You know, we don't have to worry about what we do, don't have. And that's a problem we face a lot of times as human beings. Oh, God, if I could just have this or just situations were changing. Or we just were, if things were just different. Yeah. We worry a lot about what we don't have. Yeah. We wrestle with it. But faith gets our eyes off what we don't have and it gets, us, gets our eyes up on God. And we are able to worship him for who he is and what he does. And when we start looking at who he is and what he does, we have all the reason we need to worship and praise and exalt and thank our Heavenly Father. The late 18th century Welsh nonconformist minister by the name of Christmas Evans said, Faith is not a sense nor sight, nor reason, but simply taking God at His Word. That's a pretty good definition. Faith is not sense, nor sight, nor reason. It's just taking God at His Word. Sometimes we overcomplicate faith. We're pretty good about complicating things. And you know, sometimes like my Grandma used to say, son, so you're just worrying yourself sick. Yeah. We can do that. We wrestle with fig trees. We stand there contemplating, become paralyzed as we face our fig trees and we cease our onward progressive walk with Jesus Christ. 
But the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians in a very familiar scripture, chapter 4, verse 19. He said, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. It is the infallible promise of God. We have the promise of God. We have his word. We have his spirit. What else could we need? We can and should claim the promises of God. In Mark chapter 9, there was a man that came to Jesus desperate for a need in the life of his son. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. I like this man. Straightway, immediately. The father of the child cried out and said with tears. He was passionate about it. He was desperate. He said, Lord, I believe. I'm doing the best I can to have faith in you, but I still come up short. I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Lord, I'm trying to have faith in you, but I can't even do that without your presence. You know, when we come to the, posi- to the realization we don't have to figure everything out, just believe and trust in God, we find rest for our souls. Abraham, without weakening in his faith, faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. Abraham had received a promise from God, and it didn't look like it was going to come to pass. But somehow, he was able to exercise faith and not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. He just decided as he stood there looking at that fig tree, the only option I have is to believe God. And so I'm going to believe God even though it seems impossible. And... Romans chapter 4, where we read, said that when he did not waver in his faith regarding the promise of God, it says, but was strengthened. And so when he did not waver, when he exercised faith, he was strengthened in his, in his spirit. He was strengthened in his being by exercising and believing God. When everything said it won't happen, when the fig tree was dead and withered away, he said, I'm going to trust in God because God knows what he's doing. I have no idea. And if God promised us, he's going to have to work it out. You see, it wasn't Abraham's job to work it out. It was God's job to work it out. And so he was strengthened in his faith as he exercised his faith. And that's what we need tonight. We need to be strengthened in our relationship with God. We need to be strengthened in our faith. But when a child of God standing in front of a fig tree or whatever impossibility you might face believes God and is not and does not waver, that child is strengthened. But that's not all that happens. For it said he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God. God is glorified in the manner which is incomparable to any other time when a child of God facing a fig tree, facing uncertainties, facing problems says, I'm going to trust in God. We're strengthened and the Lord is glorified. And if there is anything I want my life to do, I want to glorify my Savior. I want to exalt and bless and praise and worship Jesus Christ because that's the reason why I was created. I don't understand this thing about faith, but I know it works. Amen. I don't understand the fig tree. I don't understand this. I don't even understand how Jesus and what Jesus said, having faith in God. But I can understand and do understand and want to understand more. 
And as I face fig trees and as you face fig trees and we consciously choose to have faith in God and not doubt in our hearts, the power and glory of God will be manifest and his promises will come to pass in our lives. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. I don't know what your fig tree is tonight, but I'm here to encourage you. Have faith in God. Amen. Amen. Well, Brother Well, you don't know about it. I don't. The only If I did know, the only thing I could do is feel sorry for you, and you don't need that. But I'm here to challenge you, and I'm here to be challenged in the Holy Ghost to have faith in God. The God who never fails. The God who comes through right on time, every single time. Your fig tree's real, but greater than your fig tree is the promise of God. George Mueller, Christian evangelist from Bristol, England in the 1800s, says the beginning, the, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. And the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. Wow. The beginning of anxiety is the end of faith. Lord, help me. Sometimes I become anxious. All those scripture says to be anxious for nothing. Why? Because the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, but the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. We can find rest in Jesus Christ. I just wonder if years later after the resurrection, After the day of Pentecost, if maybe the disciples weren't together like good apostolics, fellowshipping and eating. Maybe Matthew asked Peter, said, Peter, do you remember that fig tree that Jesus cursed at one time when we were walking towards uh, Jerusalem from Bethany? Oh, yeah. I remember, remember that. Well, Peter, did, did you ever figure out why he did that? No, Matthew, to this day, I don't know. But you know what? If anybody knows, John would know. He was, God's, I mean, he was the Lord's favorite anyhow. Let's go ask John. Hey, John. Yeah, Peter. Remember that fig tree that Jesus cursed before he cleansed the temple that day in Jerusalem? Yes. Now, John, um, I know that he probably told you not to tell us, but, you know, he's already ascended. The Holy Ghost has already come. Certainly you can tell us now, why did Jesus curse the fig tree? Peter, I have no idea. You mean he didn't tell you? He didn't tell me. I think that probably the disciples never understood why Jesus cursed the fig tree. But they did learn. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know thus saith the Lord. Having faith in God really works. Tonight, I want to encourage you as you face your fig trees, as you face the challenges and disappointments and frustrations of life, have faith in God. Don't lose your faith. Choose to consciously believe Him. There's a scripture in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 29, that gives me great comfort and it simply says the secret things belong unto the Lord our God the secret things the fig trees in our lives don't belong to us but just because they don't belong to us doesn't mean that they don't have an owner Because you see the secret things, your fig trees, the situations in your life belong to the Lord our God. And so if they belong to him, 
we can have faith and confidence in him. We can trust him and know that everything's going to be all right. I invite you to stand this evening. Somebody once said that there are two stages in life. We're either in a crisis or soon we'll be going into a crisis. I wish it wasn't true, but it's not being pessimistic. It's just the truth because Job said that one man that is born of woman is a few days and those are full of trouble. As certainly sparks fly upward, man is born into adversity. Life is difficult. Life is unfair. But, oh, Jesus Christ is so faithful. So I encourage you tonight, ask if we could just raise our hands and voices and hearts to the Lord and thank him for his presence. Whatever the fig tree is that you're facing in your life, as you stand before it tonight, I encourage you to cry out unto him and say, Lord, I don't understand this. I don't like this fig tree. I wish it wasn't here, but, Lord, I do hear your voice tonight. We hear your voice tonight calling unto us, Lord, have faith in God. We consciously, willingly choose to have faith in you, Lord. I pray your blessing upon your people tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I ask, Lord, that faith would be released in the lives of your children. You are our God. You're the one who has everything under control. The secret things belong to you. Nothing is difficult. Nothing is impossible for you. And so tonight, Lord, we consciously choose to have faith in you and not doubt in our heart as we face the fig trees we raise our hearts and voices to you we exalt you i pray your blessing i pray strength i pray oh lord for the miracles tonight in the lives of your children thank you lord Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't you just thank the Lord right now for some of the obstacles and things in your life right now that maybe you don't understand where they're going, why they're there, any of it. But we just right now, as we've handed these things over to the Lord and given them, given to them to Him, let's just thank Him that He is able, willing, and is going to take care of those mountains, those fig trees, the things that are in our lives right now that we have no control over. Hallelujah. Let's just thank Him right now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, the Lord. Yes, the Lord. Yes, the Lord. Yes, the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What a great message and just so timely, I think, for all of us. He may not know things in that are going on in this church or in people's lives, but some of them I do. And I was going in my mind and just thinking of some of the fig trees and the things that are in the way in my life right now and, and uh, how often I want to take care of them myself. So many times I just, I just feel the urge to try and do something about that and try and resolve that and try and fix that and uh, what I needed to do. Just let him who has the ownership of those things just let him take care of them and just rest in the knowledge that he will take care of them and whatever he causes and however he works it out is going to be for my good. Hallelujah. What a wonderful and awesome God we serve. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Wells, so much for being here with us tonight. And I want to encourage all of you. We do have a partner's admission. I'm assuming you only left me one, did you? You have more? Okay. If uh, any of you would like to uh, take on the wells as they are going back to Chile and ministering there, uh, then please let me know, and we will make sure that that information gets on to headquarters and to you as well, I'm assuming. Amen. Let's just pray in closing. Thank the Lord for, uh, for speaking to us tonight and what he's done in each one of our lives. Father, we just love you so very much. Thank you, Lord, for your presence tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. 
God, I love your word. I love when the, your word is preached. God, with anointing and with power and authority, I love the way it works around in my heart and in my mind. So I thank you tonight, Lord. God, for speaking to me, for speaking into my life and the lives of your people here today. I thank you in Jesus' name. Give you all the glory, and the honor, and the praise. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. You may be dismissed in Jesus' name. Amen.